Um, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to those live on this class called the alternate lectionary passages, the rest of the story, where we look at all of the passages listed by the lectionary developers and seek to listen to each on its own merits and then look for any threads or uh, messages or emphases that flow throughout this. Since this is our last class, I want to thank Will Wellman for his ongoing work with adult faith formation. You lead us well, Will, and you've been a good friend and a help in this. I still have a little angst about all this technology, but with Will Wellman in the ship, I don't worry. <laughs> and uh, thank you to this class, uh, those who are on now and those who may watch later. Uh, I appreciate your participation and thank you again, Mary Beth, for your series of classes on the truth. Um, and I, in a sense, claimed the truth as the watchword for this uh, class, lifting up as the theme verse from John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And I've emphasized and will again, I don't know all the truth, but God does share with us all the truth. And in that confidence, we, we join together in this class. And I would um, remind those on this class with me that at 10 o'clock this morning, there is a one-time further class on the lectionary focused on uh, the theme for this week is Christ the King, uh, the reign of Christ. Um, and I will briefly note something that will be emphasized at the start of that class, that this very term king and reign has, for some people, become a bit problematic today because of all that can, that, that can connote about empire and dominance. But it is the title that we, the lectionary people have instigated are not instigated, uh, chosen. Interestingly, in working on this class and the other one, I learned that this Sunday was one of the last added to the liturgical calendar by a pope in 1929 or something like that uh, in an encyclical. So, and it was after World War I, as I understand it, because of the desire to find a new way of living. And one last thing before I open with prayer, as I've been reflecting on this class, especially this morning in some quiet meditation, I realize what is obvious that anytime you set someone up as a leader of anything but a Bible study, in this case, his lens, <laughs> lenses <laughs> have a, an effect. And uh, I have, I acknowledge that. You also have your own lens, and I trust that you will share what you see through your lens and not just in any way be limited by mine. Having said that, let me open us with a prayer. Lord our God, you are in Christ for us the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is the light of the world. And we live in a time of deep, deep darkness as has always been true for a broken, sinful humanity. But we believe that light. We want to see your light. And we want that light to guide us that we may be faithful and effective followers of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose presence we meet in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, we're going to start with the second Samuel passage. Will, if you will post it, and Marvin, if you will then read it for us, please, sir. Okay. Hmm. 
Now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man whom God exalted, the appoint, appoint, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the favorite of the strong one of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks through him, me, his word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken, the rock of Israel has said to me, one who rules over people justly, Ruling in the fear of God is like the light of morning, like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. It is not my house, it is not my house like this with God. For he has made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But the godless are like thorns that are thrown away. For they cannot be picked up with the hand. To touch them, one uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, and they are con they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. Okay, well, if you'll leave that up for now. Thank you, Marvin. Um, now, I, I want to offer some comments and then uh, invite you to uh, reflect also. As I read this passage, I, I thought of a contrast. And interestingly, what I got the outline from um, Sarah Mickelson, who will be leading the next class, she picked up on it too. You, you just heard um, these words that Marvin read for us. And Will, if you would highlight that phrase, verse four is like the light of the morning, like the very cloudless. Okay. Now, when I read that, it, it really captured my imagination. It, it sounds, it's poetic. It's, it's very um, evocative to describe <clears throat> A, a, a ruler who leads with justice. Uh, there's this powerful imagery. It's like the dawn of the morning, the sun rising on a cloudless morning and gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. I think I've mentioned on this class before, I've done a lot of backpacking in my life and still have powerful memories of the impact of nature in here where we live, I'm able often to be outside on Tampa Bay meditating while literally the sun begins to rise. And it, it offers a, um, a powerful expression. That, and, and I take it to mean that David understood how impactful it was to rule with justice. Now, contrast that with in 1 Samuel 8, uh, where this famous passage where Samuel is resisting appointing a king for the people, God tells him to give a message to the people and eventually, though reluctantly, Samuel um, appoints the king and he warns the people that the king they want will take their sons and daughters, confiscate the best produce of their fields, vineyards, orchards, and animals for the king's own benefit. Um, again, a powerful example of what it means to act with justice. Okay, Will, you can take that down if you would. Now, you notice that it begins by saying these are the last words of David in, in the part of chapter 23 we read. They are preceded in chapter 22 with what to me is an astounding declaration by David of how favored by God he is in particular, how righteous he is. Let me read a couple of those statements by David in chapter 22. I don't have this for you to post, Will. Um, 
let me find the verses. Okay. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, God recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all God's ordinances were before me, and from God's statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before God, and I kept myself from guilt. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. You know the story of David. How accurate do you think that is? And if not, why not? <laughs> David was an adulterer. He covered it up, tried to cover it up with murder. Um, he was a very vengeful person. Now, we've been over this before in other classes that ultimately uh, all of us are flawed. I understand that. But this, this is just me. Again, I told you about I see this with my lens. I choose to read that statement by David as an example of how tempting it is to avoid clear self-awareness and how mentally we may engage in a kind of revisionist history <laughs> and sort of round off the corners of the sharp edges of the way we have in fact uh, lived uh, our lives. Now, you may not agree with me, and we can discuss this, but I, I do find it challenging uh, to listen to how David seeks to portray himself here near the end of his life with, in fact, how he lived his life. Any of you have any thoughts on that? Any comments? Or, Bob, Robert? Uh, uh, Bill, don't you think that uh, for for many groups, uh, people, we have idealized our leaders or our founders. Uh, certainly that's true with David. My guess is that he probably did not speak those words, but somebody wrote them there for him. And, um, you know, uh, when you go to the tomb of David on Mount Zion today, there's this elaborate uh, room you go into and people actually bow down and put their hands on the uh, supposed coffin and uh, offer him honor. And, uh, you know, and people get upset if you criticize those founders, like George Washington in our time. One of the reasons there's this anger is that people are saying, well, George Washington owned slaves, Thomas Jefferson owned slaves, and people get worked up over that. They get genuinely angry because uh, what I was taught in about George Washington was that he was this great, virtuous human being and founder of our country. Uh, and then if you start talking about how we treated slaves, I get, wow, that you're undercutting the narrative. And uh, that, that's just my reaction to it, uh, that David probably was like that, undoubtedly a, a great man, tremendous ability. Uh, but in the, the uh, national memory of David, uh, just like with George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, they move towards superhuman status. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, I just think that's kind of common for human leaders. No, I, I agree. And again, I think all of us uh, run that risk, especially if we're in a position of leadership. I was, did not think about or know that I looked it up one time. I forget how many presidents we had before we elected one who had not either owned or currently yeah. owned like six or seven, I, yeah. whatever the number is. And I was a history major in college before I learned that Washington owned slaves. Like you, I grew up with this idealized right. image of him. And I think it's very contemporary, the conflict today over, do we really right. honestly deal with our history and acknowledge it and learn from it and seek to make amends? Or do we have this idealized version of it? Thank you, Robert. Any other comments? I don't want to park here forever, but it really strums some strings for me. Will? What, one thing that sticks out to me after having taught this, well, these two books for a while is right. 
I think we put our hopes onto David and I think that's why David sticks out so much because he is, I mean, not that all of us are murderers and adulterers, but all of us have failed and we know our failures. And I think that sense of David finding repentance and forgiveness is something that we hope for, for ourselves. And so just as Rob was talking about us putting our kind of just everything onto these people that eventually come idols. I also think there's a positive element to that where we, we seek out the good things that we hope for ourselves and amidst our own failures. Right. And so I, I, I don't deny that David had his faults and it's good to, to talk about those, but I also think that so seeing someone come to their death and a sense of peace is something that we all hope for ourselves. And David becomes kind of a stand in for that. Right, right. I, I, I would agree with that. It is both and. And again, I think we're all David. <laughs> and we've seen contemporary examples of what came out about uh, John Kennedy and, and his morals and Martin Luther King Jr. It, we are all flawed. And if we look for perfection, a kind of projection onto our leaders, but also, Will, I appreciate your reminder that, as I would say, ultimately, we are saved by grace. All of us, all of us are less than um, fully faithful uh, to God. Now, um, to continue, in a sense, this discussion, I, I've noted that the Bible says these are the final words of David. They, in fact, are not the Bible's recorded final words of David, which are in 1 Kings, the second chapter, where David is giving his final instructions to his son Solomon. And in contrast to his eloquent affirmation of justice in 2 Samuel 23, which we read, David in his last words to Solomon instructs his son to kill the enemies that David names, he calls them out by name, bringing, quote, their gray heads down with blood to Sheol, end quote, with David, and this is strange to me, David's support for that is he evokes Solomon's wisdom. Because of your wisdom, you will kill these people that I'm instructing to you. Um, and again, I come back to that phrase that I had Will highlight for us, that one who rules over people justly, ruling in the fear of God, is like the light of morning, like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. I, I hold on to that image that even our flawed leaders and maybe sometimes in spite of themselves, uh, j justice can happen and transformation uh, can, can occur. I, I continue to be uh, fascinated uh, by the person of David. And I, I think, Will, you, you help focus that, that on the one hand, it would be wrong to dismiss him. It would, I think, be wrong to worship him and think he was a perfect leader. But I think there's something there for us to learn about our capacity both for good and for harm. At least that's one of my takeaways that, and goodness knows, <laughs> I, have, I have not done those terrible things that David did, but I have at times wounded someone with how I spoke or what I said or what I didn't say. And I assume all of us can resonate with that and recognize that we are less than perfect, but we are capable of faithfulness. Bill? Yes, sir. Go. And don't you think it also um, makes David more approachable, more human? <laughs> uh, Jerry Ford uh, grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And my first church was uh, two blocks from the Ford paint, paint factory where Jerry worked for his uncle. I had members of my session who were in Jerry Ford's scout troop. And so uh, it was interesting in Grand Rapids, 
if you were there in the 1950s and 60s, you rubbed shoulders with, with Jerry Ford when he was just a congressman before he became vice president. And it's interesting, the stories that, that people would have of Jerry, whether on a scout camp out or at his uncle's store dealing with customers or whatever, I, I, my sense was that he was human to those people that knew him back when. They certainly knew he was not perfect. He was not perfect, but there was a humanity there. And that's, to me, uh, just very assuring that our leaders, um, unlike North Korea or China, we, we can accept the humanity of these people. And to me, that's a, that's a good thing. And I just remember back to the people that talk about, oh, Jerry and I were on this hike together and blah, blah, blah. And what, what memories people have of those yeah. moments. Yeah, yeah, uh, I am absolutely. Um, now let's, um, well, if you will post the Daniel seven passage and Robert, you're going to read it. Let me note something quickly. Um, the lectionary leaves out verses 11 through 12. They're bracketed there for you, but I have included them because I think they are important. <coughs> so Robert, if you would read that yep, for I've us. I've got my reading glasses on. Okay. <laughs> As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood attending him. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. Watched then, okay, okay. I watched then because of the noise of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking. And as I watched, the beast was put to death and his body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion was an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. Okay, again, Will, if you could leave it up for a few moments. Now, um, chapter seven, uh, in the early verses before where Robert started reading for us, begins by noting that what is being reported is a dream that Daniel had in which he saw four beasts, a lion with eagle's wings, a bear eating ribs, a leopard with four bird's wings, and a beast that was devouring and mangling. Now, um, I will acknowledge that uh, throughout much of my adult life, I've had less than an eager uh, spirit to deal with apocalyptic literature. Mm -hmm. And Daniel and Revelation, uh, both of which portions of, are in this week, are not something I have spent a lot of time with, uh, partly because of, as a pastor, seeing how often frightened this was to people, this very language of, of, of apocalypse. And I, I know there are others who um, would guide us to see value in that, and I don't dismiss that, but I'm acknowledging it's not something that makes my heart sing. Um, and by inserting the lectionaries of it, omitted verses 11 and 12, we have presented for us the, quote, ancient one, God, destroying the beast previously noted that I noted in the earlier part of this chapter. And, and then in Daniel's dream, one like a human being becomes the eternal king. And here again, that touches on part of the controversy 
and, and Will, you can take that down, thank you, um, of apocalyptic literature, a lot of Christians are inclined to read back into this that that's a reference to Jesus Christ. Uh, Jewish scholars uh, obviously do not see it that way and, and interpret it differently. And I tend to be hesitant about reading back into the Hebrew scriptures, uh, the meaning that we take uh, as, as Christians uh, today. Um, now, looking at the Samuel and Daniel passage, one of the resources that I use uh, commented on them together. And I want to try to summarize and read some of what one of these scholars said that I found uh, to be helpful. Uh, the scholar is Stephen Riley. He's an Old Testament professor. Uh, he notes, or he would suggest that these passages remind us of two extremes we can face when dealing with the issue of government. One is what we've talked about, deifying our leaders, seeing the leader as the one uh, who is in effect is our Messiah. Uh, and we may be tempted to follow them blindly and excuse their, um, their sins, their, even their crimes. Uh, that's one extreme. And the other is to believe that human governance is so flawed uh, there's no point, and that is one of the risks of apocalyptic literature is pie in the sky by and by. Things are terrible now, but we just endure this life and, and believe we'll have a better life in the hereafter. Um, but the scholar goes on to say, quote, for the church engaged in the ongoing work of God, these two texts, Samuel and Daniel, offer a counterbalance to those temptations, those extremes. We are reminded that God has always chosen to work through fragile, flawed humans and institutions to bring about a world where humans in creation can experience the wholeness God created us for. We are also reminded that God is greater than our human institutions and that our hope does not rest only in our own power to bring about change. Therefore, when we see failure and brokenness, we should not lose heart and we should not remove ourselves from the work of living out God's reign. Now, this past week has painfully reminded us of how divided this nation is over the use of violence and how we determine who is authorized to administer justice as they see it. So we, we very much live in, I think, the kind of times that Samuel and David are dealing with. Now, on a personal note, um, you know of my involvement with, in, in civil with FAST, uh, countywide social justice. Almost every time we meet with an official or we have a strategy meeting or we're working on affordable housing, criminal justice, uh, mental health, we frequently are frustrated that we didn't get all we wanted. But then someone reminds us, we got something. You follow me? There, there's always that tension and um, we keep reminding ourselves not to lose hope, um, not to settle yet, because it's this already not yet. We, we have achieved some things, uh, made tremendous uh, progress in getting the county commission to adhere to their promise to use all of a certain um, percent of the money from the penny for Pinellas for those making 80% or less of area median income. Uh, that's real progress. It's gonna to lead to 500 and something new units in the latest round of uh, units of, of affordable housing. Um, 
so for me, I resonate with the, the tension in that. And I like that quote and the encouragement uh, not to give up hope. And I don't, I, I don't know who created this quote. I've used it on these classes often. Despair is the enemy of justice. And I hold on to that because sometimes Bill Hall gets in his little corner. <laughs> and um, especially if I watch certain news sources, <laughs> Mary Beth, <laughs> I despair will over, overwhelm me. Uh, and despair is the enemy of justice. What hope do you see in your life or in the world today? Or do you see any hope? You know, Bill? Mm -hmm. uh, Nibor sees the, you know, the same thing you do, but it's, it's a very complex thing for him. And I'm assuming that uh, you read his book. It's, it's yes. a classic. And, uh, and for him, there, there are five basic approaches to a fallen world. And, um, you know, I've, I've read his book maybe three times. And I, I just amazed at his wisdom. And uh, it's a complicated thing, as you say. Uh, I have uh, some cousins in Michigan who go to a fundamentalist church. And I simply avoid the subject of political change. I, there, you can't go anywhere with it. And, um, you know, and I've done funerals where the whole focus of the family is that this person is now in heaven and that's all that matters. And so and I, on one level, I understand that, I, I get it. But on another level, I, I don't want to discount what happens here in the here and now. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to talking about uh, Niebuhr's contribution mm -hmm. to all of this. Uh, do we despair? Do we throw up our hands? Do we withdraw? Uh, do we compromise our values? I mean, I, I agree. Those are relevant questions today. And I know, Will, I assume you're still working with refugees. Uh, there was a program or something you, you mentioned. I'm sure you, you folks are frustrated at times. Um, and another example, because um, an another thing that for me, and I think it's in my notes later today, uh, that often we are surprised by hope. Um, this retirement community is a part of a statewide program called Westminster Community of Florida, faith-based, Presbyterian-related, but interfaith. Um, found out recently from our new executive director here that at the corporate level, the board made a decision to seek to make a difference in resettling families from Afghanistan. Now the headquarters is in Orlando. They have made a commitment to sponsor at least 10 of these families to help them with housing, medical care, finding jobs. Um, and it may involve some of us regionally. It, it, the commitment was just recently made. And I tell that story partly because when I was on the board and chaired it for six years, we, some of us advocated something similar at the board level and were told of the majority opinion was that's not our role. We are simply to manage these communities that are under our oversight. I was so delighted to hear that corporate uh, is willing to take on that challenge. And the, those of us at the table hearing this said, you know, let us know how we can participate in that. So I took that as a sign of hope and a surprise, <laughs> especially since I'd been frustrated some years ago in advocating something similar. Mary Bell. Bill, you, you asked, where do we find hope or do yes. we? Yes. And I think sometimes for me, 
the last few years have been um, rather overwhelming. Um, and it would be easy to fall into despair because the problems are so big and so deeply embedded. And um, sometimes I find it hard to find hope. But for me, it's easier if I think about instead of the big problem, what can I do locally? What can I do in my own community to make a difference? Um, and so, so I, I try to remember little things with great love. And if a lot of people are doing a lot of little things with great love, it has a large impact. And I just have to focus on those things rather than how immense our problems are. Right. I remember coming out of college and being involved in the civil rights movement and being at a meeting one time. And again, I don't know who first came up with this proverb, uh, think globally, act locally. Uh, that was very helpful to me. It's the mm -hmm. same kind of thought I think that, that, that you're expressing. Any Bill, yes. well, I was just going to say on on the apocalyptic side, because I'm preparing for the class I'm teaching next week, and Advent starts with an apocalyptic text from yes. Luke. And I think, especially in that time, you know, the, the Jews have been under um, foreign oppression for hundreds of years, and it's been particularly bad under the Romans at the time Christ is around and apocalyptic literature kind of arises out of that. And I think one of the important things of apocalyptic literature is the imagination. Um, it imagines a, a different future. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, apocalyptic, I always say is like, it just kind of comes out of nowhere. And it's like, it, it's something that seems impossible that rises in the midst of, of, of the possible. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, I think it's important to think about hope in that way. I don't think hope is something that's future oriented is something uh, in a Christian context. I don't think it's future oriented. I think it's something that we have to kind of imagine and create instead of just say, well, this is our next goal, or this is what's going to happen next. Um, because I think that's, that's that's the whole thing with apocalyptic literature the the jews have been under oppression for hundreds of years and yet they imagine that they won't that something different will happen and i think that's what the kingdom of god is in a way is that amidst the just disheartening realities that we face every day we imagine that we just random people can change the world uh through through grace and through the spirit and through christ and i think that that impossibility only happens through imagination and that's what hope is not saying like, well, this is our goal. You know, we're going to feed X amount of people, but rather we're going to imagine a reality where people are not hungry and work towards that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That that's some of what I've read. I appreciate you've reminded me. Uh, I, I noted earlier that there are scholars who believe there is value in these, this apocalyptic literature and you've highlighted a powerful uh, potential. You think about, the inventions and medical progress and oh, it, it's somebody or somebody seeing a problem and imagining what they might do to deal with that. And that, even just saying that, there's a sense of power in that, that we, we the imagination leads to action, leads to believing that individually and collectively we can make a difference. I, I never have memorized John Wesley's famous quote, my Methodist brothers quoted to me, do all the good you can in all the places you can with all the people you can for as long as you can. Again, I'm, I don't know if you are familiar with it, but it's that same kind of, of emphasis. I can't do everything, but I, Sybil has a thing on the refrigerator in effect. I can't do everything, but I can do something. <laughs> That's like the uh, Howard Thurman quote that I'm going to butcher, but it's something to the effect of um, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive, because what the world needs is more people that are alive. Ah. I've, I've always liked that. 
I just, I think it kind of shifts the focus and it's helpful. And I like that alive. <laughs> Again, suggestive imagination that um, I, I hadn't heard that quote. I'll, I'll look it up. You said it was Howard Thurman, right? Okay, good. Any other comments before we move on? Um, let's go to Psalms and Faye, if you will read these for us, well, if you'll post them. <clears throat> Psalm 93. Uh, the Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. He has established the world. It shall never be moved. Your throne established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. More majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea, majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. And Psalm 132, 1 through 18. <clears throat> o Lord, remember in David's favor all of the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and bowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. We heard it in Ephrathus. We found it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Rise up, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your faith shout for joy. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away from the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back or of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my decrees <clears throat> that I shall teach them, their sons also forevermore shall sit on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will reside, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless its provisions. I will satisfy its poor with bread. <laughs> oh, it's there we are. <laughs> Oof, it's priests I will clothe with salvation, and his faithful will shout for joy. There I will cause a horn to sprout out for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed one. His enemies I will clothe with disgrace, but on him his crown will gleam. Thank you. And Will, if you could scroll back up to the top of Psalm 93. Um, a couple things I would highlight uh, quickly. Uh, if, if you sign in to the class at 10 o'clock, you will hear some caution about, uh, again, this term, uh, the Christ is king. Uh, but I will note for us that in the very first words of this psalm, and there are other references, God is described as king. The Lord is king. So the, at least the Hebrew scriptures and I believe the New Testament scriptures embrace that image of God. Uh, and we think of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. Now, I'm not arguing the point that there's a problematic quality that in today's world, but the scriptures have no reservation in speaking of God as a king. And here again, for me, there is some powerful language. Uh, if you will, would highlight verse, verses three and four for me. Uh, the floods have lifted up the Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. How more majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea. Majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Again, to me, uh, this portrays God as 
uh, one of majesty and strength who will rule forever. And for me, there's hope in that, that no matter how we miss the mark, God's desire for, for justice prevails in, in spite of our failures. And, and you can take that down, Will. Thank you. Um, and then Psalm 132 is a so-called song of a sense which people sang as they approached Jerusalem uh, to go into the temple and to worship. And it was encouraging them uh, by remind, remembering, reminding them that God knew their hardships and inviting them nevertheless to go and worship. Uh, again, I find that powerful image that we don't wait until all is right in the world before we worship God. And we can go into worship individually or corporately with grief, with pain, with disappointment, uh, a sense of guilt, what, whatever is a part of our human lives, we bring that to God. And I think that's part of the power of the Psalms. There is a call for revenge at times in Psalms, bash the baby's heads against the rock, the babies of our enemies. There are these majestic words. Brueggemann does a much better job of expressing that than I would ever attempt to do, but that the whole range of the human experience, yeah, I think is reflected uh, in songs. And again, there is a, a note of honor and respect for uh, David. Now, um, in one part of 132, it says, I have prepared a lamp for my anointed one. And that, again, I have some reservation about reading back into the Hebrew scriptures, our Christian meaning, but it does remind me in the Gospel of John, the frequent use of the imagery of light. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed one, that the anointed one is one who has light and who sees, I would say, injustice and what justice would mean, who sees hunger <clears throat> and what being fed would mean, <clears throat> who sees people on the margin as people of equal value in God's sight, that whole imagery of, of light. Um, and that psalm for me affirms the potential for justice that governments can do. And I believe governments, maybe, as I've said earlier, at times in spite of themselves, uh, do act uh, for justice. And it could also poignantly remind us of the times that justice does not prevail. Any thoughts on those songs before we move to Revelation? Oh, Mary Beth, while I'm thinking about it, back to my <clears throat> question about hope. <clears throat> Your class on media gave me hope. Quite honestly, Sybil and I have yet to work through all of those resources we're going to. <laughs> We've been pressed since then. But when you think about the number of organizations you identified who are working for truth, who are not trying to be partisan, uh, th that gives me hope that there are people in the, in the face of the monstrous challenges of the abuse of media who nevertheless are seeking uh, to find truth and to help us find it. So since I'm talking about you, Mary Beth, Will, if you'll post the Revelation passage, Mary Beth has agreed to read it. Revelation 1, 4 through 8. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. 
<clears throat> to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Thank you. And again, Will, if you could leave it up for a moment, uh, and I'll have you highlight something in just a moment. This obviously is the beginning of the book of Revelation. Here again is one of the apocalyptic books, and we remember Will's helpful reminder about imagination. And right here at the start, it engages our imagination. Uh, the passage begins with verse four. Verse one notes that this is, quote, a revelation of Jesus Christ, and that those who read and keep what is written will be blessed. I had never noticed uh, until this study the power of the very first words of Revelation. It's about attending, listening, reading, listening, and then it uses the what's translated as keep. You know, live what is written here. Um, it, it's signaling, I, I, at least for me, as the one who has some hesitation about apocalyptic literature, it's signaling the importance of understanding and of action, concepts that I find very important. Now, it, Will, if you would, in verse five, it highlights, it speaks of Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. That, that's fine, leave all of that. Again, that term faithful witness, I take that as existential. Jesus Christ, even this moment in this class, is a faithful witness. Jesus Christ is still witnessing to us of who he is, who we are, and our place in his kingdom to act on what he calls us um, who he calls us to be and what he calls us to do. Um, and that we, there is power for us in that. Um, okay, Will, you can take Wait, that wait a minute. Oh, Bill, go, 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 go. Okay. Um, when he says he's, um, that Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, um, mm -hmm. when, when, Christ was called before Pilate, and Pilate asked him um, if he was the king of the Jews. Um, he said, you say that I'm a king, um, but I, and I'm messing up this quote, but um, I am, I am the witness to the truth. And then he goes on to say something right. about um, if we, if uh, those who, those who listen to me, will gain the truth or something right. to that effect testify to the truth yeah. that's it thank you will yeah and uh, thank you we're, and that's in the next passage that we're going to look at but you know, thank you for that reminder now uh, something i want to note uh, before we go to the john passage um and and this was highlighted for me last week in a training in the Orlando area by the national organization of which uh, FAST and your organization HOPE are members. Micah 6.8, as anybody at Thomasia knows, <laughs> calls us to do justice, to love kindness or mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. The training emphasize that there's a dip or at least in our modern mind there is a complementary nature but a difference between mercy and justice mercy can be feeding somebody lunch today powerful witness very important justice can be understood as working to transform the structures of society so people can make a living wage and 
in some ways be self-sustaining. You follow me? Now, I don't want to hammer that too much, but <laughs> the training did <laughs> that acts of mercy are very commendable, but in and of themselves, if you settle for that, uh, that won't lead to transforming the systems that oppress people or keep them in, in poverty. Now, you may or may not agree with that, but I found that to be a um, helpful emphasis. Uh, the John passage, Will, I know we're getting close on time here. And again, Mary Beth, I think this is what you were referring to. And I'll oh, read it. sorry, I didn't, no, I didn't no, know no. we were going there. The spirit led you to do that, Mary Beth. <laughs> <laughs> you built a bridge for us. <laughs> I'll read this. Then Pilate entered their headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so are you a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. A couple of things I would quickly highlight. Jesus doesn't say my kingdom has nothing to do with this world. He says it's not from this world. It's not grounded in the narrative of Pharaoh or Herod or whatever other dictatorial name we might uh, come up with. Um, I was just looking at, oh, I just saw the chat. Thank you, Will. <laughs> I will copy that. Excuse my, uh, Okay, thank you, Will, for posting that Howard Thurman quote. Um, so it's not of this world. And then it's interesting to me as a standard, if we are basing our kingdom truly on God, we will not engage in acts of violence um, to preserve that. He says, if it were from this world, my, my followers would be arming themselves and uh, trying to use violence to institute what I'm about, but they don't do that. Now, um, let me ask before I offer a closing, uh, any comment, I realize we're pressed for time, but um, any quick thoughts on this John passage? I have a yeah, question. Yes. A question. What does he mean? Uh, what does it mean when it says everyone who belongs to the truth? I don't really understand what that means. I'm not sure I do. I think that he he's saying I'm speaking a truth. In reality, there are a number of truths being spoken <laughs> then and now. There's Pharaoh's narrative and Herod's and the dominance and the scarcity messages and fear. Jesus' truth is fear not, it's abundance. Uh, so I think he's saying that those who listen to that truth, Will or Robert, you have to, Will? I, I think he, he means belongs to him because in yes. chapter 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right. And then in chapter 19, he talks about the little ones that belong to me. Right, thank, thank you. Okay, thank you. That I, 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 that, that's, that's helpful. It's about relationship. Uh, with Christ and following him. Very helpful. Uh, other questions or comments? Um, I'm going to end with a quote in a moment uh, and a prayer. Uh, but again, I just want to thank you for this journey together. Uh, I have learned a lot. 
I have found this very exciting and challenging and ultimately affirming and uh, helping at least myself to remember that despair is the enemy of justice. Here's a quote from one of the scholars I read that I find a helpful summary and challenge. Quote, this is a uh, quote, Christ challenges us to look for his truth from unusual persons in unusual places and to accept them even when acceptance makes us uncomfortable and challenges our assumptions. Christ calls us to remember that truth did not reside with Pilate and Rome, but with a carpenter from Nazareth. I love that phrase in it, with a carpenter from Nazareth and all that that conveys. <laughs> Uh, in that world, a working middle-class person. Uh, let me close us with prayer. Lord, we have each week begun by being reassured that you are the truth and that your spirit leads us in the truth. We claim that promise. We embrace that confidence. And we trust that the wind of the Holy Spirit will blow across and through now and in the future all that we think and say and do and separate the wheat, the kernel of truth from the chaff, our culture influenced distortions, that your truth may be planted in us, that we may be receptive soil and that our faith in Christ may grow, our willingness to follow the lead of the Spirit may increase, and that our faith and confidence in God will guide us and lead us now and forever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bill. Bye. Thanks so much, Thank Bill. You. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. It was a great, oh. great course, and happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, good happy job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Happy Thanksgiving.